included by mistake i included well not by mistake by a few people made some suggestions last week to look at the data centric architecture so i have got that at the end of the deck um there are loads of slides on the data centric architecture so please guys if we get if we get to the end and you need to go um please don't, don't feel bad um, we will include the deck for distribution so and and the recording and then so it's almost in in two sessions we'll do the data architecture and the day in the life of a data architect and then we'll also look at the data centric architecture as as we promised last last week um so th there are a lot of slides today so please hold on um and let's see how we go thanks paul thanks everybody and it's lovely to see everybody again uh especially the external people as well as the internal people so let's let's go through so we are at this stage we've done the practice managers um we've done the data citizens that's what happened last week and today is on the professionals and um i i did we mentioned it quite a few times in the advertising and i was actually quite keen to just maybe take a quick pause and a, and a sort of check on on hands up is has anyone um, done a day in the life? Uh, does everyone know what, what that's all about? Um, have you done it for yourselves? Um, so any, 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 anybody done some analysis on the, the day in the life of a data architect? Oh, not many. Okay, I will, I will certainly encourage you to do it. Um, I, I did it uh, almost about two, three weeks back when I started thinking about this and I started looking at, at my time that I spend with one of my customers doing some architectural work. Uh, it, was, it was a little bit embarrassing <laughs> the first time I did it, but uh, it, it's quite an effective tool. So I really like to show you through that. And then after that, we're going to the daily executives and we, so that's for next week. So please, Hold, hold any of those questions for next week and, and off we go. All right, so we want to just complete the essential concepts. We know we've been doing it for quite some time. We've gone through it. And really what I'm trying to do here is, is explain where the data architecture uh, fits in into the context diagram of the DM box. Okay, so everything now we're mapping onto the DM box. So there are things, then you'll see that my list of activities when we do day in the life of that are that are outside of the dm box but um our focus and and our, our attention is at the dm box level these are the uh this is the context diagram for the dm box i'm sure you guys have recognized it and our very first one we did the practice manager and they were responsible for establishing the enterprise data architecture and they were responsible for these deliverables um, and then we did the data citizens last week and we had the inputs, they pr predominantly providing inputs and helping with uh, data value chains. And then today we've got the data architect. Okay, and you'll see that the data architect is, is involved in setting up and, and developing all of these inputs, plus the delivery of these uh, three uh, deliverables, the data flows, the data value chains, and the enterprise data model. Um, and the practice managers is, of course, uh, responsible for the other set of deliverables. Okay, so what, we've been through this one, so I'm not going to spend too much time. These are the deliverables. These are some of the, the, uh, the lower level deliverables that I keep using. For example, I use the term data estate, uh, very similar to a subject area model. It contains the stakeholders, the value chains, and the data flows, and data products. And we'll see how we're involved with that. That's the introduction. We've been through that in the last couple of slides. Also, what is a data architecture? I don't think we need to spend too much time there. And the amazing thing about this on the essential concepts as a data architect is that you need to know, as a professional, you need to understand all of these different areas. Um, so certainly when you're writing your CDMP, or, or we're actually in the process of uh, building that CDM, the data architecture exam for CDMP, when you do write it, 
please note that you need to know all of these different areas and you should be able to talk to them. And if you want to do a master's or get the master's level, you should be able to comment and apply it and actually relate to all these different areas that we've set up over here. Okay. Um, then when we look at the, the actual activities that are being performed, we've got the data architect, the practice manager establishing it, the data citizen, and then we've got the data architect dealing with managing the requirements within the project. Okay, so the data architect, for example, would be picking up uh, business requirements and data strategy, and, and of course the practice manager will be defining what they do, and then it's up to the architect to allocate almost some of these requirements and the business requirements to specific projects within the organization, and they would be critical to the design uh, of, of that um, project, of the data areas within that project. Okay, now they would also be very critical, and I'm sure you guys are, are involved with that, anyone who is in the architectural area, in terms of the, the methodologies of delivering uh, projects, be they waterfall, incremental, and agile. Uh, still, today, I'm still seeing, in some cases, waterfall approach. And, you know, initially I thought we were over and past that, but I do see in some cases, especially with regulatory reporting, uh, is it has to be pretty much a waterfall uh, approach because you can't half deliver on compliance. So, uh, important to understand that. Okay, uh, there was a question, uh, where, where can we learn the area of data architecture or the art of data architecture? Um, this it's a very practical uh, it's a very practical area um, so and it's and it's made up a lot of the different uh, aspects that we deal with there is a chapter in the dm block um, that talks about the data architecture it's it's relatively small so it doesn't go into a lot of details um, but a data architect needs to be very well aware with metadata the, the definitions of taxonomies the language and also the, the data estate, the subject area models, data modeling. So you'll, you'll tend to find that data architects come through the ranks of all the different, the other areas and they, and they almost mature into data architecture. All right, and from a technology point of view, and then we also have governance. Uh, I typically don't, uh, the government, the people are there in terms of the uh, enterprise architects. I've, I've shown you the different personas. And when we go through the Zachman framework, this was where our, our data architecture practice manager uh, operates. And then we have the uh, data citizens. And I have added this in terms of the data architects that would almost be responsible in a few of these areas. They, as I said, they come through the ranks, so they probably were a technician and an engineer, and now they're an architect. And they are able, pretty much able to deal in a lot of these different areas. And to communicate some of the requirements down to these different levels. So that's that's my impression of, of where the data architect plays a role in the in the Zachman framework. Um, and then we we've we've got this breakdown. Uh, it is important to to understand, and you'll see in the day in the life of I separate between these different architectural types. Um, but we'll we'll have a, a bit more detail about that as we progress. Yeah, Melissa, that's, it's an interesting, uh, it's a really interesting um, comment that you're making about going completely agile. I, I, I do agree with you. I think there's nice uh, to actually make use of the things, certainly scrums and, and all of those types of scrum meetings and those things are, are very helpful meetings and aspects like that. But whether you're actually going to deliver a product or a minimal viable product um, and you can uh, you can operate in the, in a, I mean, a lot of the times we'll do it in iterative developments, but the minimal viable one, certainly from compliance reporting, needs to be complete. And yes, there is a there is a culture change to that as well. Um, we were actually doing a roles and responsibilities for a scrum master, and it was quite interesting when we apply it to the different uh, knowledge areas. Okay. So that's the essential concepts. That was the brief overview. Um, I then now want to go into the actual professional that we were talking about. And this is 
I think I, I have brought it up a few times lately. I, I got really excited when I had to do it for a data governance course where I work with a lady called Christine Iotis, who is part of change, uh, culture and change. And she does this on a regular basis. And I was, I was surprised at how, how much time she actually put into this and how little I knew about it. And if I'm, if I'm not incorrect, it seems like we all don't know a lot about the day in the life of. So this, this is, it's, it's quite embarrassing for me because I have spent quite a bit of time on organizational role modeling and expectations, especially when we say this is what this person should do, but I haven't spent time analyzing what is important, what is the critical work that needs to be done by a data architect. So we'd love to get your feedback, we'd love to get your impressions of, of the value, the value of this type of exercise to you guys. Okay, so we'll start off on a little bit. This is uh, just some feedback of, of what Christine does. So I was fortunate to be involved with her on, on a data warehouse project. We then introduced a new role within, within the warehouse project, um, and it was involved with the uh, almost the data scientists the, the company I worked for didn't have a data scientist and she had to prepare the day in the life of. Now, what she did teach me was that there's typically a before and after, but if you're introducing the role for the first time, it's really just a to be. And uh, I really like this image that she that she presented. And if and if uh, when you get the deck, you'll be able to see that a lot of the times the, the initial um, project manager, he spent lots of time with different things, fighting with different technologies, trying to get feedback, very manual. And then you can see the day from seven in the morning to seven uh, all the way around, the, the guy spending all the time uh, working. So he, and then what uh, Microsoft were trying to do was trying to explain the impact of Microsoft Teams on an IT project manager. and how they could improve their efficiency and effectiveness. So what it's really about is, is saying, what work are we doing? And I'm sure a few of you guys, and, and I actually, um, the other day I had a, had a quick chat with one of my colleagues, one of the customers, and she said she actually had to go back to doing a timesheet for herself, not because she was asked to, but she wanted to understand where her time was going. And and where 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 was she, where was she wasting time, and that really led me to to spend a lot more time in building something, doing some research, getting some templates, and and seeing how it applied in my life. Okay, so this is an acronym. So I, I don't want to keep on saying day in the life of so <laughs> the Delo concepts, and you can see um, in terms of reference data. What I've got here are activity categories. So admin, administrative work, job tasks, interruptions, waiting time, project work, meetings, coaching, interviewing, and traveling. Now, I suppose the, the only one area that I didn't have much time cataloged was my traveling time. I, I hardly do any of that. And what I've done is, is for each one of these categories, I've put a, an effective rating and an efficiency rating. Okay, and these are the different uh, scores that I've that I've set up. Being one being a waste of time, uh, two being if I'm effective, am I doing it the wrong way? So if we look at all the techniques that we're applying, uh, are we doing it the wrong way? Are we halfway? Are we doing it the right way? And then when it comes to efficiency, are we doing the wrong things? Are we doing the right things? And in some cases. I've marked this as we're doing the required things, and that's something like filling out timesheets, uh, attending meetings, and that you can't discard it, and you can't say it's a wrong thing. It's something that has to be done. Okay, so and and please, this is my allocation of what's important to me. So, for example, I allocate uh, halfway to meetings. I don't enjoy them. Um, I don't always see that they get lots of value out of it, but it is it is important, so I can't discard it. 
and I do believe it's required. Um, waiting time, it's also a frustrating thing where you're waiting for certain deliverables or you're waiting for certain feedback. Um, and and you and and you can hang in in certain cases. Um, interviewing, uh, coaching, they they sort of interviewing. I, I'm finding I'm wasting a lot of time on interviewing. I'd much prefer that HR people could do the interview, but that's not always the case. Okay, so I've taken the day in the life that change managers use across all roles. So. When a change manager is brought in to bring in a new application, change a way of work, whatever it is, it's, a lot of the times they, they apply it to new technology um, and they would just analyze the impact of that technology is going to have in the day in the life of whichever role they, they're talking about. Now, I've, done, I've taken this and applied it to data architecture. So you can see, as I, as I mentioned uh, some time back, We've got these different persona for data architecture. We have our practice manager that was the first week. Then we've got our architects, um, enterprise, domain, and technical. And then we've got our entry level that, that, we, that we're operating at. So those are the personas that I've, I've done some analysis on. I, I did focus on the enterprise architect as part of the results. I've also broken down the data architecture in work streams. Um, just so that I can get an understanding of where we're spending time. And that was that was quite helpful for me. Um, and I'm sure you've seen that in the DMBOC, in the, in the chapter. It talks about, are we doing strategic work? Are we doing uh, areas in, in culture and change, organizational uh, setups and configurations, uh, federated models, distribution of roles and expectations? What are our working methods, our data architecture working methods? Um, what results are we are we achieving measurement uh, and then undefined and, and you'll notice that uh, I consider all of these aspects so if we're doing activities involved in these different work streams I consider them to be effective and efficient okay and then I've taken my activity list in terms of what I generally have been doing in in the role of data architecture so these are some of my activities that I've got um, so it's defining project data requirements, it's reviewing project data designs, determining data lineage impact, uh, controlling data sharing. Uh, now specifically when we get into uh, data architect, uh, data privacy, uh, this data sharing becomes more and more complicated. Um, enforcing data architecture standards, guiding data technology, uh, evaluating existing architecture specifications, uh, building a data estate, establishing an enterprise model, backfilling an enterprise data model. I've done a lot of this um, where the projects are doing some really good work and uh, lots of the thinking has been let's get projects to deliver some of this instead of us having 10 people building an enterprise data model. So you'll, you'll do some modeling at a project level and you say, no, this is actually helpful at, at an enterprise level and then we pull back the, the project models or the data models from the projects into an enterprise data model. So that's why I call it uh, a backfilling. Then we've got enterprise data flow, data value chains, review the data state, practice establishment, setting up of the practice, project stand-ups, departmental stand-ups. Um, I don't know about you guys, but with data architects, it's, it's quite unpleasant where you could be operating at four or five different projects and you just get all these continuous stand-ups in the morning it's, it's quite intense. Uh, and then you've got your own departmental stand-up about your own work. Uh, community of practice engagement, uh, understanding business requirements. And next to it, I've got the deliverables. So what are we producing? What are these elements producing? So we're either producing data products or we're producing data lineage. The P3T stands for principles, uh, principles policies, procedures, and technology. So that's almost as part of the definition of how we do the work. And then we've got an enterprise data model. And you can see there's other aspects like communication, awareness. And then, of course, I've got undefined where I just can't position the work I'm doing into, into a specific or a decent slot. And I've just allocated that as a waste of time. But, uh, it was interesting when I set up a, an operating model for one organization 
one of the metrics we had was was almost the uh, how much time we were wasting, and we uh, we started to measure that, and and we started to get quite a fright on on doing that. Okay, so there's a question from Kipal. Kipal, is it fair to infer that some of these core activities are also applicable? Uh, yes, yes. So, for example, uh, enforcing standards, uh, certainly P3T, that would certainly become as part of of uh, data governance. Data quality has the same thing. And, and so you can apply quite a bit of this. Um, the data modelers will get involved in in back helping us backfill on the on the on the enterprise data model. And then your data flows, you'll get metadata coming in there as well. And of course, you've got uh, practice establishment across all of them. You've got standups across everybody. Okay. Does that answer your question? All right. Okay, so what's in, what, why do we do this day in the life? Uh, what, what is it all about? Is it just, um, and, and there's actually quite a nice website and I'll, I'll, I'll share the links later on where, where what they try to do is to say, please set your objectives of why you're doing this analysis before you do it because people can get quite concerned about, are you starting to measure them? Are you starting to play Big brother, are you starting to micromanage them? What is it that you're doing to to bring this about? Um, Marianne, the P3T stands for principles, policies, procedures, and then technology. So you first of all start off your principles, then you have your policies. Procedures include standards and and guidelines um, in in that situation. So let's focus on on what is it that we're trying to do with this day in the life, and um, I have done it for my own personal efficiency and effectiveness. Okay, so I wanted to understand what work, and it was specifically when you start working from three o'clock in the morning till late at night, then you want to start asking these questions and showing people that maybe you're wasting your time on doing the wrong things, hopefully not the wrong way, um, because that you can correct. You can personally correct if you're doing something the wrong way. But if you're doing the wrong things because people are asking you to do stuff, then, then you need to make some adjustments. Okay. Um, so here's just the definition of effectiveness. This is the way I like to see right way, halfway, and wrong way. If it's the right way, my technique is defined. It's managed and measured. So I've got, I've got P3T sitting behind me on this on this right way. I've I've done that as part of the practice. Halfway, I've sort of I'm I'm using external techniques that have been uh, used by other people in the industry. Um, for example, creating a subject area model. How would you do it? Um, and doing a data model. So those are the techniques. And then the wrong way is I'm just I'm just using a technique, but I can't find any definition. I couldn't find any documentation that would justify why am I doing it in a certain in a certain form. I'm just doing it because that's the way I think it can be done. Or well, that's the way I've I've had to do it. Then when we look at efficiency, it talks about the right things. So activity are defined as part of the knowledge area. The required things, activities relating to the organization and not the role. So if you're on a project, you've got to do the project activities part of that culture change that we talk about. And then the wrong things are, I'm doing activities that are not defined. So it's not part of the organization, it's not part of their architecture. Um, and it's helpful when you start defining that and realizing how much of the stuff that you're doing that is not really there. Now, please remember that um, certain of us are in, in some cases, in certain projects, you'll actually play multiple roles. So you'll wear multiple hats. So you may be doing the data modeling and the data architecture, or you could be doing, you know, a, a combination of data modeling and data quality and metadata. So um, it, it does get a little bit more complicated than just saying, ah, I, all I need to do is data architecture. I don't need to worry about anything else. Okay, so this is analysis that I've got in the spreadsheet. And if anyone is interested, this is the spreadsheet that I've set up with the reference data, and then I've got different areas on the different architects, the domain, the practice manager, and technical architect. And what I'm doing here, if you notice, is that I'm logging 
my core activities and the time that I'm doing on an inner day. And I got this idea from my brother who ran a manufacturing company uh, and he had this mantra that he kept on uh, drilling into everybody. He said, a day is work in a day. And if, you, and if you're carrying stuff over, then you're not completing this day's work in a day. And he wanted to know. So the question then came about, well, if I take my, my day from 8 until 5 o'clock, and my day is certainly starting earlier than that, and then I break it up into what I should be doing, I can then get a certain amount of percentage of how much time am I building the enterprise data model? How much time am I building the data estate? What time am I spending on projects? What time am I spending uh, uh, spending on coaching and things like that? Um, and so when you do that, it's actually uh, really nice that you can then go and look at your personal effectiveness. So if I've allocated, and remember this is my rating of what do I think a stand-up should be, and so I've said, as far as I'm concerned, the departmental stand-ups were going in the wrong way. We were wasting time. I have to do it, but I don't believe it's effective. Um, and I'm sure Melissa can share different uh, how how badly one can run these stand-ups. You all of a sudden you're dealing with details and issues that you shouldn't be, and everyone's having to listen to to everybody's problems. So there are certainly some wrong ways of doing it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to add to that, Howard, and say that it should always be kept to like 15 minutes, yeah. these kind of stand-ups, and I think what ends up happening is that, as you say, you just you just end up talking about all, all sorts of other issues and actually get end up resolving issues in those meetings and talking about the technicalities instead of kind of just agreeing on what are the next steps. Right, you know? right, and, and, it, and it gets quite frustrating, but... And, uh, and I suppose you, uh, you know, if if certainly if you if you come into a new organisation and they're just trying out the different agile approaches, um, and you're not a scrum master, a lot of times I find it easier not to not to make too many comments, um, but really just to say, guys, this should be done in 15 minutes. I think we're wasting time. Let's let's look at redoing it or changing the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, so this is this is this was for me. This is my personal effectiveness. So you can see, um, um, I, now it's it's embarrassing when you when you're running as a consultant and you and you're billing hours and you're wasting eight to ten percent of your time. Um, that's not bad. Uh, and then we have the wrong way, which is nineteen point five percent. So these different stand-ups and different areas are are, are costing me. Um, and then I get into a halfway, but then and then I get into a right way. So effectiveness and efficiency was was better. So I am doing the right things. I am paying attention to this, to to the appropriate elements. Now again, uh, I was using this as an example, and um, I think the the measurements could be a lot worse if you if we were to look at our organisations. Uh, Debbie, I saw your hand up. Did I answer your question? Are you okay? Uh, no, I would like to ask who is responsible for analyzing uh, the dialo? Okay, okay, um, sure, Debs. It's it's it's. I think sometimes it's it's typically the change manager that starts with this, and that's I learned it from from uh, from Christine. She was the one, and they they know about it, but. Uh, for example, if your team is not being effective, then it could be the Scrum Master, and in some cases it could be the practice manager that's that's feeling that they're not getting the um, they're not getting the the throughput that they need, and if they're constantly battling to deliver and and stick to it, then they may um, they may want to take it up and and do that uh, analysis. So it's it's really about are the right people doing the right job um, and, and in the right seats? I think we had that, I think it was Paul, was that Peter Dricker or someone who, who kept on saying the right people are in the right bus and the right seats? Well, Jim Collins. Jim Collins, that's right. Okay. Yeah, good to great. Yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Coffee breaks. Um, you know, I do find that uh, certainly you and I haven't allocated that time to to that type of situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. I keep my coffee pot on my desk, and I have coffee breaks when when people uh, have a Teams meeting, and that's actually quite nice to to have my coffee breaks then. So now I don't have to type that quickly. I would before you. Yes. Just want to raise this one point and maybe ask the rest of the group if they've got the same experience. So when we were working in the office, you gain a lot of information from those coffee breaks. Yes. At the yes. tables and having chats mm -hmm. and all of that. Right now, working from home, you have a typical day like you've explained it here. It's one meeting after the next. Right? Yeah with no breaks in between any of them. So you work from the morning till the evening. Not only are you tired at the end of the day, but also you feel, I feel a little bit less productive because I didn't have that personal interaction with whoever I saw. Yeah, you, you, you raise a, a very important point. Um, and I must admit what I have done as well is, is uh, I actually get on quite well with Outlook, um, and and my Outlook looks like a, someone called it a Christmas tree when they saw it the first time. Um, I have different categories. I use Power BI to analyze my time. Um, so this is just a quick view of, of what my Outlook looks like, and if we jump around, I've got these different colors that come about. I've got like governance, I've got these different areas. Um, and when I'm having lots of different colors, then I know that I'm jumping around tremendously uh, and, and I need, and so Outlook's been quite helpful in allocating focus time uh, and that, and then I, I try to protect that. It's not easy because people then just book over that um, and, and you, you're jumping around too much and you're having too much, we, we're spending more time having meetings than actually doing work. Um, so Kamal, this was, I think lots of people identifying that and, and almost saying that one of the root causes of that is that we, we don't have proper knowledge management and we don't have proper practices. We haven't got them properly defined. So to actually understand what people are doing and need to do, um, we were sort of getting that done over, the, over a cup of coffee at the coffee shop or at the, at the water cooler or whatever it was. And, and the project managers were able to check us out or, or pick up pretty quickly. Now they can't. And so they're requiring more face time, which means we're spending less time working. And I think you you have identified something that we we were all suffering from is, is too, ma too many meetings, too many uh, sessions. And you were just going from, I mean, previously you would have a break between meetings and you'd walk between the meetings and, and there was a level of discussion. Now it's just you stop one and you go into another if you're lucky or you, you leave one a little bit late and you into the next one. Has anyone else got a comment on that? Anyone? I, I'll, I'll pipe in, Howard. It's Mark here. Um, yes. We at, at my client site, I get an email from Cortana every morning suggesting focus time, learning time. Yeah. Break time. yeah. And at the end of the week, I get another email saying, let's take, a, you know, do you want to analyze what you're up to? Yeah. And it says, you know, you worked on cloud documents after hours. Uh, yeah, yeah. It says things like you gave very little warning to your coworkers, like you called a meeting in half an hour. I just want to get an answer on a, on a question so I could go back to my next client meeting. It's very interesting. And you can actually go into Power BI if you have Teams and say, okay, I yes. want to analyze my day in Teams. Like how many chat? Man, it's very. It's, I haven't done a lot of it, but it's. Uh, it, it yeah, seems yeah, to and, uh, and it's it's super helpful, especially for contractors. Yeah. And I'll, I'll share things with you. For example, these are my categories. Um, we've got different breakdowns, and I can. I'm doing data governance. I'm doing DBA. I'm doing these different areas. So yeah. I I allocate my time like this, and then we analyze them, and understand that I'm I'm operating in the in the right area. And certainly uh, Cortana helps me do it, uh, helps me allocate the time. He's even got to a point where they do have breaks, where they can allocate 10-minute breaks in, in, in your calendar. 
And then I've also got an end of day procedure. And I learned that from uh, the deep work. Cal, Cal Newport. That's right. So that end of day procedure, when you when you go through your emails and you you pack everything away, and then I close it, and then I don't open it until the next morning. So I I, I really it's really important for me to know what meetings I'm having first up in the in the next day. Um, yeah, and Melissa also talks about not getting that thirty minute thing or one hour. Uh, making it 45 minutes and, and just finding techniques like that that, that are helpful. Um, but yes, I, I think what's what was important, um, what was important for me was was just this core activity. What time am I spending on the core activities? OK, so so that was that was concerning for me. And then what percentage of the time? So I did it durations in the day. And then I did what's my weekly duration. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I, you know, I've sort of set up this idea on, on budgeting is the best thing to budget from a financial point of view tends to be a 12 month budget and not a month budget because you can get some serious shocks within a month. And then it's hard to keep to that area. So similarly, I do a week budget for my time. So for example, when I do webinars, then I want to budget the weekly expense of a webinar, not a daily expense. Otherwise, I could find myself really having a lot of time allocated to uh, webinars and community of practice. Um, OK. Uh, all right. Howard, how, how long is your work week in terms of hours? Uh, I don't think I should tell you. <laughs> OK, that tells me a lot too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and, and it's just we we in some trouble situation with one of our customers. On average, I'm starting at four um, in the morning and finish at about uh, half past five. Yikes. So thank you for still making time for us to learn from you. Like yeah, despite all true. that. <laughs> all right, and I was I was saying that uh, I was saying that you know I use this as my learning experience. So it's it's really helpful to. That's when I learn, and I and I show you with the data centric architecture, just going through these things and understanding. But eight hours, eighty is um, you know it's it it gets and yeah you know, weekends are also involved. Okay, so this is this is what you're trying to develop. Um, so there is a Power BI there. Um, and you want to be able to look at what tasks are, are low effectiveness and low efficiency. Um, of course, you're wanting to get the high effectiveness, high efficiency. Um, in the first, in the first couple, in the first week, it was a little bit embarrassing. I was sitting sort of uh, low effect, low. I was sitting high effective, low efficiency. Um, so that's that's. Uh, that's where you've got to you've got to start operating it. Okay, but it's it's nice just to analyze it and, and realign, um, and then it's it's actually and I found it from a, a contracting point of view and a consulting point of view when you go back to your manager and say, look, this is I've done an analysis of all my work, I've kept all these timesheets, um, and this is where what I believe. Um, are you in agreement? And if you are in agreement, can we make some adjustments? And it's a really nice place to start the discussion. OK, um, and they may think ah, an enterprise data model is not of interest to me or a taxonomy doesn't fit it or an ontology. So let's make the adjustments and it's actually helpful to have those reviews um, and, and give that feedback. All right. Are there any questions about day in the life? Um, any observations? Excellent. Uh, and again, if you if you're looking for just some samples and some templates, I can share. Um, I also share some websites that I found to be very helpful in this, in doing this analysis and setting objectives and things like that. So, so if you are no, interested, uh, Howard, I, we, I I was too slow to hit unmute. I I I now I want to. I did a screen cap of your little Excel table you had up there last slide just to motivate me to do the same thing. Because I think my I think my client uh, leadership would be impressed if I did that. Yeah. Self analysis, like 
it's great to be invited to these meetings, but you're, you know, you're paying me and I'm burning a lot of time not yeah. moving the needle, right? Not moving the puck up the ice, as we like to say here in hockey land. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, and and, and it, it really helps. And I know, I mean, I, I, I do that detailed categorization. Um, I pull out the data on Outlook using um, Power BI, um, and then we send it across to uh, the customer. First of all, she really likes the breakdown, and she helped me design the categories. Um, and then there's this constant checking. Why are you working here? Why are you working there? What's this meeting in 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 consideration of? So so they they really work. They really pay attention to it if if they've got the data. Um, it's all about the data. And yeah, I yeah. Imagine doing Cortana across a, a work group. Yes. The you know the let's say you've got uh, in. A, a data architecture team. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's four data modelers, there's two architects, there's a couple of designers, a couple of business analysts, and a manager. And then you took all of that and said, okay, this is what we're faffing about mm -hmm. on. Yeah, very interesting. Scary yeah, I mean, and uh, Mark, I don't know if you, I mean, if, if you've, if you've operated in a, in a data architecture department across a big organization, uh, I'm, you know, I've experienced times where uh, architects have been involved in eight to nine uh, projects, each project wanting a stand-up. Now you're yes. talking eight times 15 minutes. I mean, it's, when do they get time to do any work? I, that, that's exactly the challenge I'm having today. That's why your little Excel was so useful to me. I'm only in five projects, but yes, they all want a daily stand up. And oh, by the way, hurry up and get this report done. And oh, by yeah. the way, we're telling the business, do not stop running your business on Excel. Use Power BI against the data mart that we're going to build in the warehouse for you. At the same time, we're tracking our workload in Excel. We're tracking our projects in Excel and we're tracking our field mapping of source system to warehouse in Excel. No. So, so we're, we're telling the customer, don't do that, but that's how we're doing it. Because leadership won't take the time and take three of us and lock us in a room and come up with a little, you know, eight, you know, 16, 12 entity data model that captures all of this stuff that we could then slice and dice and yeah. power BI to death if, if we yeah. took the time to build it. But we don't. It's got to be done for Thursday, not correctly. Yeah. But, but you know. Your your time could be like billable, so you know those couple of hours you're locked in a room they can't bill someone else for. That's well, that's it. But you you know it, there's there's practice management, and you should never try to be a hundred percent billable. Yeah. You have to have time to sharpen the saw. Everybody read Covey. There there's there's mm -hmm. some stand up work to be done. Uh, this is a new team in a new department and a new, you know, and it's support, supposed to support the enterprise. Sorry, I'm, we're not supposed to talk about our work clients. And so I'll stop. <laughs> Understand. Understand. Um, uh, Covey is, I think it's Covey, Stephen Covey, is that correct, Mark? Yeah, Steve yeah, Covey. C-O-E-Y, um, yeah, Melissa. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and and it does. That trust is 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 great. And and I find when I, um, and I don't know about Paul. He's also involved in the, when when we start to do these weekly timesheets, and you start to have the questions at the right time. It 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 really makes a, a big difference. Okay, and then you give them the opportunity to to make the adjustments, which is fantastic. All right, so. This is we we had this discussion. This is sort of the the data flow that we were talking about in the value chain. We've we've gone through these different areas, so I'm not going to go through that again. Um, but that's typically what you're dealing with. Uh, and then you've got your CRUD matrix that comes out uh, according to the subject area model and uh, related to your business value chain. Um, and we then having the managing enterprise requirements within projects. I think this is really important from a data architect point of view. You you can build that enterprise data model as much as you like, but if you don't get it embedded and entrenched within the business and getting projects to deliver, it's a waste of it's just a waste of effort and a waste of time. Um, 
So how do we get the enterprise model into the enterprise? How do we get the, the solutions mapping to it? And how do we understand the requirements? And then, of course, the data flow across these different areas. Now, uh, and, I, and I once walked into a bank and, and it was interesting, the data architect had just been retrenched. And I asked to have a look at some of the, the work that she had done and she had done a flow, a data flow and a data lineage across the organization and I was blown away and I thought, you can't be serious. Um, this is really important work that she's done, but they could, they didn't recognize it. Um, and that was a bit depressing. But anyway, these things happen. Um, then we've got these uh, alignment, specification alignments that, that I, I didn't want to go through. And then we've got uh, project related activities. Architects have to be involved in this buy, reuse and build um, and understand how to make some of these decisions with respect to the implementation. So yes, they're doing understanding the requirements and the design and then implementation becomes one of these three options. That, that, that they can look at. Um, development methodology, I, I've sort of spoken about it. I don't feel that we need to spend a lot of time. There's there's some nice areas within the DMBOC, but as, as data architects, you need, to, you need to understand when and where and why do you apply these different approaches. Um, EA integration, that means uh, back to your enterprise architecture, your technology, your business and applications, all of these areas should be working together. Uh, and, and it's up to you to get that architecture team working and working effectively. So it's not just data architect and data projects, it's also you and the others in terms of getting this all to operate correctly. All right, so that, that sort of brings me to the end of day in the life. Uh, these, are the, these are the activities that you should be doing. And the next section goes into the data centric architecture. So I wanted to take just a pause here. Are there any questions before we go into the data centric architecture? It's quite different. It's, it's, I mean, it's certainly, this is the new way of thinking that the data architects need to start thinking about. Um, and, and certainly it's being challenged by, oh, that's what David McComb has, has put forward and been challenging us quite, quite a bit. So any, any comments, any observations before we move on? Just want to say thanks, Howard. I'm going to have to bail out for that pesky client I keep talking about. <laughs> okay, I'll send you. I'll send you the you um, the Excel and the Power BI. I just wanted to understand: did, did you are you guys using that enterprise data model from Microsoft? Or did you have a look at it? Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're mapping all our three thousand. So there's one stream work stream trying to reduce three thousand source systems to one thousand business simplification project programs okay and the other work stream the one i'm involved in is now taking those source systems of course including sap and all the the other 900 so probably there's about 500 we're going to attack and mapping those trying to map them to the microsoft enterprise what was the adrm model and then by exception creating new entities and attributes as required because every business is a little bit different uh, but to standardize as much as possible and the there's multiple work streams mapping and we're implementing informatic mdm and we're implementing calibra and all this stuff is moving at the same time all to be in azure and it's um, causing me hair loss okay so yeah so, I, I know that i've done an exercise of bringing that microsoft model into power bi so so you know um it is helpful to to make use of those tools and then to have the the data lineage and the and the mapping for you. Yep. Um, so hope, hopefully you have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I'll see you next time. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for joining. Yep. All Bye right. Uh, fantastic. So let's 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 spend some time uh, take going through the data centric architecture. Um, I I really see the value of this, uh, and I've been. I get more and more excited about it each time I talk. Um, and typically where this comes from and, and almost for, also my understanding, this is my interpretation, is that what's happened to us uh, since the mainframe. So if we think of, if we go back to the mainframe days and, and I was a DBA on, on, on a IBM mainframe in the 80s, 
and everything was centered in this one mainframe. Um, and then we had the PCs coming about and we had this massive separation and, and everything started to get fragmented and the scale of fragmentation is really high. And it, and it just scales and scales and scales to a point where just about every single new application that comes into your area causes more fragmentation, more data fragmentation. Um, and this is what, what people are trying to address. Of course, they're also trying to address complexity and achieve simplicity and extensibility, which we'll talk through. But this is what we're trying to do is, is to first of all start at the data now it's also about wrapping the the, the nasty data and, and that in in a in an ontology that has a federated query system underneath it so it's very much like data virtualization if you remember part of our discussions last week was was if i can build a data model and then uh, allow the federated query to go and get the data where it, where it needs to and where it can find it. It can either go to the data lake, it could go to a microservice, it would go to mapped external data. But the nice thing about what you're getting here is an ontology that um, contains and houses the data. The transition period between taking the data off the mainframe and creating a different database or a different approach or a different technology, that's that's um, far away for that's divorced, the applications are divorced from that approach. Um, and then what one does is you you have the core ontology and you're really trying to keep this as simple as possible. Um, and there's some lovely statistics that uh, David McComb has brought up in terms of the number of objects in the SAP environment. Uh, he was talking, uh, and I, I think I got the numbers somewhere along here, but there were crazy numbers in terms of how many data entities were involved in that. And he asked the question of how sustainable is that model? Now, I suppose we need to ask the question, well, SAP's been around a long time, and it seems pretty sustainable at the moment, uh, just from a, an, an age point of view. And it keeps on growing, and, and I'm sure people feel that it's getting better. Um, now, what they're trying to do is you, you develop a core ontology, and then you extend the ontology for a specific domain. So, for example, you could have a core banking ontology, and then you could extend it for credit cards, right? Or you extend it for home loans. And this is what this domain extension is, is all about. Um, so, Esti, you talk about a data vault, and the answer is it doesn't really fit in here uh, other than the um, data storage systems that are that are covered by the, the ontology. Um, and so, uh, so what you, and then you also talk about with data modeling, a lot of it has now progressed into the development of an ontology and the extensions of ontologies. So that's the core element to it. Now, it's actually, I, I, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about this in terms of saying, what happens is if I extend the ontology, the extension to the ontology needs to still fit into the core ontology so that the core ontology will delegate the queries to the, the, uh, the core ontology and I can still, uh, and I can still satisfy that query, um, which I find very interesting in, in to be able to achieve that. All right, now, as you can see below that, you've got the different levels of, of data getting from different areas. But then notice that the UI is now all built around the core ontology. So the nice thing about that is you can typically throw away the UI and replace it without throwing away the data. Uh, and that was the big change of thinking that David McComb introduced as a case of saying, guys, these UIs, they come and go so quickly, uh, and the impact of them coming and going at the moment is that we have all created these data islands. We then have a massive problem on, on migrating the data from one application to another, and this is a, a massive job. Whereas if you take a different approach in terms of doing model-driven UI or model builders, 
um, then you don't you don't fit into the problem because the data never leaves you. The, the data asset is always there and you keep on growing the data asset. It doesn't need to be in a single database, but it needs to be encompassed around a virtual data model or, or that, that implements the ontology or a federated query. That's a different approach. And then you can see we start wrapping with identity management. We start bringing in constraints, different behaviors and, and stuff like that. So that's the, the crux of a data-centric architecture. That's that's the visualization that I like to do. But what I found important is is drilling down to some more important concepts of let, let's get some better definitions. So we, we were to define data centric, and I must admit, I first saw this and people were mixing up between data driven and data centric. And, and I, it, I had to take some time in terms of understanding exactly what data centric meant. And I like this definition. Uh, a data centric enterprise is one where all application functionality is based on a single, simple and extensible data model. OK, now, and, and I think David does a lot of that where he tries to say, well, a lot of you probably don't believe me, but here are some case studies and that that he's done in terms of showing how he's, they've been able to achieve it. Um, so certainly go and refer to. And to me, this is, this is the important area, the single, simple and extensible model. So that's what data cent centricity is. Applications come and go. You can throw away the different UIs, but your data remains the same. Um, and, I, and I must admit, <laughs> I had a chat with one of my customers and, and she said, you data architects are all the same. You think there's, there's, there's no other reason for applications other than data. And I, I, I thought about it for a while and I said, you're right. I, that's exactly what I believe. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have a discussion about when an application is not about data. Okay, so what is a single data model? So if we take those words and we say, what is single? Um, there's typically, you one would have one data model per application, and when you look at the SAP one, that, that, that is quite uh, hectic. Um, the desire is that application work with a single data model across all storage types. So whether it's relational, whether it's in SQL Server, whether it's in mainframe, whether it's on a document database, whether it's in a graph, it's all one data model. Um, does that make sense? Has anyone got any questions on that? I know it took me a while to, to work through that statement, um, but this is the desire. This is what we're trying to do. So we want to be able to throw away the application. We want to be able to sunset applications when we need to. Paul? Um, Howard, yeah, I just um, want to say we've um, recently uh, we've sort of got a chance to dig under the hood of, um, of Informatica's uh, product Axon. Yeah. But it implements this idea because it's one, in this case, it's, it's one application, but yeah. under the hood it's got a graph database, it's got um, Elasticsearch, it's got a oh. database, database, um, but you don't see it from a obviously from an end user perspective, um, when you have to maintain and install it, you obviously, you realize it's, there's quite a lot to it. Yeah. Um, um, so I guess this is a, uh, this is an application where it sort of fits the description that I see there. Um, and, but then from the other side, I'm thinking about EBX, in Estee, I know you, um, you've also worked in it. Um, and EBX, from an application point of view, I, I think follows this philosophy pretty well because everything starts with your data model. Yeah. And and lit and literally, I mean, you can do customization on the screens, but everything pops out of your your data model as the starting point. Whether it's your your integration, you know, your your um, your services uh, contracts, or whether it's your screens or your processes, even. Um, uh, is, is that sort of in line with you have in mind here? Yeah? Yes. So that's certainly now that certainly fits the single data model. Um, and one would ask the question: Does that mean I can develop any application on top of this data model? And if the answer is yes, then yes, you have got a single data model. Yeah. 
Now, remember I said the definition was single, simple, and enhanceable. So we'll go through the different areas, but yes, you can almost say for sure that that axon area, if it continues to add on components and functionality and sticks to the single data model, then yes, it has ticked that box in terms of being a single data model. Now, can you have a single data model across a banking application, credit card, home loans? Um, would you use, is, is it the application that is creating the single data model and, and on its own? But then you're using SAP and everything else, so you've still got the you still got the net effect of it it then housing its own data, and then you you challenge because it's created another version of its data. So data centric says we, we're going to wrap everything in one single data model across the across the enterprise. Yeah, realistically. Realistically, you're gonna have to, you can only achieve something like that with virtualization, I presume, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I know what what Tipco has done um, with EBX is it's actually making us part of their data virtualization offering. Um, and I mean, I've been working in EBX for seven eight years, so it was it was a surprising and interesting move when they bought Orchestra and they went there. Um, but now you know I, now I can sort of see why they did because. The, because of the fact that EBX works off of your data model as a as a you know as a sort of a primary starting point, um, you can use that to to be the pass through to data lying elsewhere. So from your model perspective, kind of working in EBX, but it goes and um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's basically the the middle layer. Um, but what, uh, and and so let's pause that one. Now. I'd like let's go to the end of all the definitions, and then we ask ourselves again. Is it a is it a data centric model? So, uh, and what I try to say to you is yes, it's ticked off the single data model view, but let's let's keep going. Okay, and we'll get back. Max, I, I see you got a question. Yeah, I have a question. Why, why is it desirable to have one single data model? I understand that it's desirable to have a. I mean, each attribute have a, a distinct definition and. Um, and probably in the, also including how that is rep represented, like age, for example. Or, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you have a graph database or relational database, they have different purposes, and, and and I don't understand why they should have the same data model, because a uh, graph is really more aiming at natural relations. Why? Well, you might have a completely different um, intention with a relational database. You, you're asking a, a fantastic question. That's a great question. Now, what what we are talking about firstly is is I use the word data model, but the implementation is an ontology, um, and the fact that it is stored in a graph database, or it's stored in a document, or a relational, or a dimensional. That's your physical storage, but your ontology can be used to interpret data that's in a graph database, and you can connect it to uh, a relational database. So what it is saying is that you then have the ability to connect all of your data together with that ontology, and whether it's in the right graph database or whether it's in a dimensional database or whether it's in a relational database, you've now got the concept and it can be stored in different in different uh, database management systems. So it's very hard when you have completely separated database management systems and you want to understand everything about a credit card and you've got some in a graph and you or a customer and you've got data separated all over the place. You then start to battle to bring all of these areas together and, and provide a unified understanding of that customer. Mm -hmm. And okay. so there's some other people that have spoken about harmonization. And your, the answer to that, Paul, is yes, this certainly enforces harmonization, right? So you, you're talking about a, uh, a standardized uh, data model or a core ontology 
and everything, all the domain extensions map back to that core ontology. So yes, there, there's certainly a harmonization that is achieved through this process. Okay, so then there's Melissa is asking to reflect multiple source systems to have one data model to store all data model from, yes. So that's a, in summary, Melissa, um, you can have data distributed in all different places uh, with different data technologies, and then you've got your mainframe and stuff like that. So how do you provide a unified interface to the data within the organization? And, and this would be fantastic, for example, if you look at data privacy, and one of the one of the requirements you need to answer from a data privacy point of view is to say, uh, if I came to a bank and I said, what is all the data that you know about me and are they consistent? So am I consistent on your credit card, your home loans? Is all my data the same? And now, certainly some people try to achieve that with a, a master data, 360 degree view of master data to bring that all together. Um, in that in that uh, situation. OK, so let's let's go a little bit further. I just want to take you to the end of this definition. That is gives me my single data model. Um, and so th the importance of getting a single data model is the core ontology. It's the virtualization that we're talking about. And it's that federated query to be able to go and get the data from wherever it's at whichever database management system it's sitting in, be it in a data lake, be it whatever it is, um, you, you, you need to be able to access that data and then present it in, in, a, virtualized, in a virtualized format. Okay, so this left-hand side is, is pretty much that single, single data model. Um, so that's, how, that's, the, that's what we're doing to get the single data model. Okay, so what is a simple data model? That's the next step. So, um, Okay, so typically at least uh, 100 to 1,000 times more complex than necessary. So David McComb did a lot of analysis across all the different systems. I had some interesting uh, discussions with Steve Hoberman when he was asked to produce a conceptual model of SAP. Um, he, did he spent quite a lot of time producing that conceptual model and he presented it to the board and he was, they were blown away and, and one of the execs said, for the first time I can see all of our data. That was quite a shocking statement from the execs of, of a major application like that where they, they were only starting to see it at the same time. So that, that's one of the areas that he addresses and we know, and I'm sure you guys have known that, is that when you do, I don't know if any of you guys have been involved in doing a mean time to failure or an impact analysis on an application and code. And one of the things you start to realize is that every single line of code that's introduced can introduce a bug. So every single entity, every single table, every single uh, column creates the possibility of a, a bug and a, and a problem that you have to deal with. So it is, it is critical that we try to stick to that simplicity. Now, if we just keep on, and, and this is sometimes interesting in, in things like EBX, if we just keep on extending the EBX data model to take whatever, whatever I like, is there a, a requirement to get harmony and, and to map back onto the core ontology? Those are the types of questions. And does it remain simple? Or do we just keep on adding? Paul, is it, is it, are you forced to keep coming back to that same data model or can anybody just add any data element and then? Um, you, can, you can have separate models. Um, the schemas maybe is a better word. Yeah. They can refer to each other. So the extensibility is, is fairly nice and, and modular because you can have, on the same engine, you can have multiple applications running Working off of different. Okay, but sorry to interrupt. That's that's not what I'm asking. You talking extensibility? That's the next point. I'm talking simple data model. Yeah, maybe just ask your question again. Okay. Now, when and I I know EBX. I know my involvement on EBX. It's certainly not yours and and Estes. 
Remember, we talk about that core ontology. Remember, yeah. this this is the core ontology and extends. And I keep saying that extended ontology needs to be able to map back to the core ontology so that you keep your core as simple as possible. Yeah. Now, with EBX, with these things, can you just create any data anywhere and and you don't have that requirement to map back to the to the single data model so i can extend mm -hmm. and will add infinitum but when i then have a possibility of those extensions becoming duplicates yeah i, I do get the question i think you will be able to do that the application won't force you to come back to the single ontology yeah. Um, uh, that's a matter of design. The app, you know, the technology will not. Will not yeah, it's not. It's not, it's not entrenched, right? So, so yeah, what, yeah. You, what you what you're having is the ability to create all of these different storage elements inside of it, and then store custom away here, yeah, custom away there, and then someone's got to bring it together and say, "All oh, right, this is all of customer." Now, it does. You can achieve it with good uh, oversight. And, and reviews yeah, yeah. and but yeah, you, yeah. you now you you are you're having to bring it in and having to get people to buy into the concept of that whereas this one's enforcing that okay and that's the i i feel is is where the different thinking has come along now think mm -hmm. about these ontologies and taxonomies and taxonomy is a nice way of uh if i've got my core set of facets of a taxonomy it's easy for me to say this is a uh, a product, so I come back to a credit a credit a credit card being a product, and I can map it back to all products have a core data model. Mm. Uh, it has a customer. These are core business concepts. Those those ten or twelve that we do in the subject area model. Now, th that's what that's what this that what this thing is demanding of you to pay attention to that. Because each time you introduce that thing and you keep on running around, you create problems. You 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 introducing challenges, uh, and so the harmonization goes out of sync. The, the that complexity starts to rise. Mm. Yeah, I mean this is an inter interesting conversation because what you what you are um, what you sort of suggesting. I'm not suggesting, but what this idea is suggesting is that. Um, is that technology needs to play a much bigger role in the in the in the governance and design of how things develop, right? No. Uh, what I mean is, what if I mean you is, have a core ontology. You have to when you build your domain ontology, you have to derive of my core ontology. So it's not about technology. It's yeah, a data no. model mapping, right? So I don't care whether you've got SQL Server, Oracle. I don't. I don't really care. Hmm. As as a data architect, I'm I'm getting control because I have the enterprise ontology. I have the core enterprise ontology. I can allow you to extend and grow, but you're growing within the guardrails. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. But, but I mean, the question, the discussion up until now was about EBX. Yeah. Maybe it's just the implementation technology, right? So you, you can't. It, it has to happen with governance and with conformance to, to the ontology and with architecture oversight, um, because you'll have an EBX, but you'll have a hundred other systems as well, possibly. It needs to make use of that idea, isn't it? Well, what what David McComb is suggesting is that you you basically ground up this thing and and you start with a core data, um, and and all applications have to conform and be harmonized to the data model. The single yeah, yeah. simple data model. Yeah, but, but you're always going to have the the your phenomena of applications being built that needs to conform to that, but it won't it won't ever be a single technology. Yeah, but I, I, I said it, I didn't suggest that. I said all the data elements, whether it's relational, whether it's dimensional, mm. whether it's SQL Server, whether it's a document, whether it's a mainframe, because the applications are not exposed to that scenario, right? The, all that data is hidden behind that core. 
They don't yeah, get yeah. to the data other than through the core. But 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 what is? Yeah, I mean that that's true. So what I'm what I'm battling with, maybe you can help explain. So that. Let's 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 just go to the next one. Sorry to keep doing this. So we've let's go to the three areas, go through it, and then and then we can have all the different discussions. All, all we're trying to do here is define criteria as to what defines a data centric architecture. Cool. Okay. All right. So we've got. So the, on the simple one, I like this quote of everything is as simple as possible, but not simpler. <laughs> and so that core ontology design is, is quite interesting. If, if you go too simple on it, then it it's becomes meaningless and everyone has a good reason why they shouldn't use the core ontology or harmonize to the core ontology. Okay. Then what is an extensible data model? Um, so this is what we what we have learned about relational database and that's where we changed into the graph databases and and almost the unstructured data is relational is very rigid um, it has the problem of if you don't define the schema and it has all the cardinalities and things like that you, you can't tomorrow without making any code changes introduce new new concepts new elements it's it's a rigid format now you get benefits out of that and, and it's certainly valuable but it's it's it has a rigidity to it and it requires professional techniques to actually achieve it um so we know relational is rigid there, there's no there's no getting around that and we can see that people hack the columns and overload the use of tables because it takes too much to change. So they do all sorts of fancy stuff, fancy stuff. That's where the data vault came in. That's where knowledge graph came in to make it more extendable, anchor modeling. Uh, so for example, you could argue that relational to the fifth and sixth normal form is extensible. And that's what you're getting with the data vault. Um, and a knowledge graph is, is another area where they only really got three elements and it doesn't and it can grow without you having to add any relationships and a lot of it's metadata driven so but but you know that's that's the important part is is understanding if if your relational model is too rigid uh, certain business requirements come along and the only way you fix them if you want to do it properly is by performing a schema change and and then it's more when you want to restructure the relationships that you have a problem if you're just adding a new concept then um then it's okay and that's what data vault and anchor modeling are talking about is they're saying it's an additive model it's not the situation of you should never break anything uh, that's already there and the focus on that is a node is a key the business key and it doesn't have any more attributes otherwise it is going to break at some point in time okay so the bottom line is that it's designed and implemented such that changes can be added even whilst the application is in use okay so that's that's what they refer to as an extendable data model so we can continue to grow this data model um, and we've got the right design so that each time we add a new concept in, we're not going to be forced to change an existing set of relationships. So that's our extensible data model. And then just to just to map back to that picture is uh, the single and simple. That's that's what we refer to as the core ontology. Extendable is the domain ontology and taxonomies. Um, and then, okay, so this is the definition that he, that he brought about. Concerned with data models that emphasize what the data means, that is the semantics, and only secondly, secondarily, and sometimes locally about the structure, the constraints, and validation to be performed on data. So I'm sure some of you guys have noticed there that uh, in that data-centric architecture, um, You'll notice here, for example, the integrity management and the identity management was sitting outside of that data model. Which is, 
typically not what we do when we do a, a relational database, right? We try to get the, the data model to be as, as uh, self-serving and, and, and constrained as possible to ensure that we, we, get, we get all the right constraints. And now you can see that these constraints are added in layers, identities added in layers on top of the ontology. Um, and so you, and so what David McComb is saying is these things are not semantics. They're not meaning. The ontology, the core ontology and the domain, that's your semantic area over here. So what you've got is this nice separation between semantics and non-semantics. So things like UI, data security, authentication, model driven, these are non-semantic elements of your data. And on the left hand side, you've got your semantic elements of your data. Okay, and then just a quick thing in terms of how do we measure data centric? Uh, an organization is data centric to the extent that its application landscape adheres to this model. Okay, basically, how many applications adhere to the same simple extensible data model? That's that's how one measures a data centric architecture. Okay, so there's there's a lot more that I wanted I, I can take you guys through. Um, there's a whole presentation on that, but I thought that was almost a, a valuable um, understanding of what data centric is all about, or how is it defined? Okay. Um, so ST 100% uh, off the shelf products destroy data centric immediately. Um, and that's what part of the design is, is to say, um, let's, let's build a scenario where people are developing applications or, or interfaces or UI on top of my data, not the other way around where they're taking my data and making it their data and then creating a different channel. Paul, can, can we come back to your questions? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to parse what this means in practice, you know, and if this, this is, as Esti says, I mean, you, it's going to be very difficult. Um, it's going to be very difficult to to realize this in an organization, uh, just because of the disconnect between um, an architecture team, if they even exist, and uh, and application. Let's call them sponsors or sort of people who, who get business systems into their areas. Um, so. Uh, while the idea is really great, and I can see some applications actually can work that way, um, and this is sort of why, why I get back to the technology is, and the you know the ratio between the ontology and the technologies gaps um, will always be will always be established only from a governance point of view. Right? People need to make sure it happens. Um, you you can't you can't have you can't have tech really. It's tech won't help you uh, to get this right. If I can put it this way, this way. I agree. Uh, it's yeah. it's your it's your core ontology, um, and it's that federated query and the virtualization that that's enabling the data to be located in different places with different technologies and hiding away that technology barrier. So you could be putting it on a data lake. You could be putting it on top of a mainframe. You could be putting it on top of your SQL databases. As long as your federated query and your ontology supports that consolidation, um, that's what's important. Now, in reading through some of Dave McComb's stuff, he, that's, that is part of his challenge in terms of, of being able to convert Brownfield's organizations into, into this type of, of scenario. Um, yes, that, that's, that is a problem now to get everyone under a single ontology. Now, in some cases, one of the areas I've, I've seen him do it is to say, let's focus on the analytics. So your enterprise data warehouse, your self-service analytics, all of that comes into a core ontology. Your knowledge graph, all of those type of things, and your data lake. So let's start to consolidate that as, as <clears> step <throat> one, and then move to, as people see the value of it, start moving into, into the application side of it. So you now start developing applications on top of 
uh, an ontology that's supported by a master data system and, and things like that. So it's not saying you're going to throw away master data. It's just saying that you would access your customer in a master data source using the federated query according to the customer ontology. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, I just realized that um, while we spoke is the, the only, depending on your on the size of, of the organization, of course, but um, the only place where you where you can really get this to work is if you if you look at it from the from the BR analytics data warehouse world because that that's where you build things right. All other places is where you I mean there's a big drive. Essie and I was talking about it today, um, and it's, and it's not new, um, but there's a big preference of having config over code approach to businesses. Yes, yes, and I actually, I wanted to show you that, and, and there's there's a lot more to it. That So he's, and, and it's great to actually listen to his different talks and, and go through those talks with him, right? So he then talks about uh, data-centric consequences. Um, almost data-driven is not a consequence, uh, and it's not the same as data. So I wanted to just go through that. The different consequences of data is important, and it's the only enduring asset. Um, applications are not capital expenditure. Um, and then he, he talks about all these different areas. This is a diagram of, of looking at a data-centric business. And, and you, you, you're right, this takes a culture change. It takes a different way of, of going through it, um, yeah. building the different governance. And he's got some nice things in terms of, of looking at T box, C box, and A box, and, and things like that. So, lots of different things that you need to consider to to bring about this scenario. And it and it feels initially as a revolution, and not an evolution. It's almost you got to throw stuff away. But that wrapping is quite interesting that applications are doing. So we've got some questions. Kamal got a question, and then Mohammed. I um, just more comment rather than a question. Um, your data exists because you've got a business, and a business exists because you've got a mission, vision, and values. So the problems that I'm hearing um, you guys are having, is there maybe not a deficiency of relating the mission, vision, and values back to your um, data architecture? Look, I, I think the, the 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 problem is more a historical one. Where at at one stage in my career, everything was data centric. Um, it was all about a, a single data store. But with the advent of all these fancy applications and all the applicate all the vendors introducing new technology and presenting it as the silver bullet, people jump onto those technologies, not realizing that that jump causes another silo of data to be created, another level of migration, and we we jump after technologies and we jump after off-the-shelf products because our IT product our IT is not delivering fast enough. And and so it's it's consequential. Business need to get delivery done so they go and buy a product. Um, and you and you can't force and people haven't thought about bringing it all together and being able to consolidate it because it's you just you you're not going to be able to buy many off the shelf products when you when you go to this approach. You certainly couldn't buy SAP or, or or things like that. So Kamal, I think it's I think it's more about what's happened to us from a from a technology historical application where everything's been focused at the application technology level and not at the data that you could then start to link to your business. I'm not sure if I've if I've answered you correctly. I'm very um, on a delivery way of thinking and always when you do a project or a replacement of technology, you'd always visit the mission, vision and values and then if you go to the project chart of why you're actually doing things, what the benefit realizations and will you be able to achieve that? So I know we have a lot of history and where I also come from, um, systems were there and make it work. Um, don't give me all this fancy ERDs and yeah, yeah. the guys on top just don't care and they always ask, 
okay, you're showing me all these diagrams. So what? Am I going to make yeah. more money? Yeah, and it's also about I, I need to solve a business problem now and you saying we're going to take the next five years to establish this data-centric architecture. Correct. Have a nice life. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, it is challenging. Mohammed? Yes. Um, hello, everybody, and hello, Howard, and um, Hi. very grateful to be with you today, and thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, actually, I have uh, two questions very uh, quickly. I will be referring that we have all one goal, so it will be a data-driven or to have a single source of the truth. So the consolidation is our goal. So um, when we are looking to have a data model or uh, having the data in, into a data lake. He was uh, referring to um, the data-centric approach and the extend extendable uh, data models like data vaults. My question is that um, when we are building data warehouse or our data model on Hadoop or a big data platform, um, what is the best um, architecture to apply e e either if we are going to have normalization or denormalization uh, because of Hadoop? This is the first question. And the second question is that how to uh, like um, prove or make an ROI for an organization to go such technology, having big data platform and data lake, uh, building your data warehouse on Hadoop? Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I need to ask you a few more questions before answering. Uh, and I want to just come back maybe to your second question. Um, so, so if when you go into the data lake, um, and it's and it's, I find a lot of times it's also I, I got involved the other day with someone asking about microservices. So, uh, someone came up, an architect came up, said we need to go to microservices, and when I discussed the principles and the attributes of microservice being you're talking about millions of, of, of queries and transactions or, or interactions with the system in you know within within the time periods that other people have thousands um, they said no 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 we have very low uh, volume so I said but then why are you trying to go to microservice microservice is designed for scalability um, and sometimes you have to ask yourself the question, when we go into new things like data lakes and stuff, why are we introducing this? What, what, was, what was the drive to get it or to get into Hadoop? Is that because we have a vendor that's pushing us into Hadoop? Do we have a business requirement and, and, and a business need for that type of, of scalability? Um, and then what I... What I I'm trying to, what I believe David McComb is trying to address is that you can have all these different technologies and you can choose the best of breed technology for the type of data that you're storing. Um, but it's the ontology and the core ontology with the federated query that wraps all of this and hides it from the application. And what you're trying to achieve is that the application is not creating and forcing and, and consuming and then holding on to data and causing a situation where that data is not an asset because if you throw away the application, you throw away that data. And you have to go through a process of migrating it into another one, which is just more costly. And you're now having to constantly move this data around to look after that asset. So it, it was almost a case of the applications were assets uh, and the data was just something that went with the application. Now we try. Now we're trying to turn that over and say, our our data is important. Where it lives, what application lives on, what the UI is is not really uh, should not be driving our decisions in terms of of how do we build it and what the semantics are for the data. So we we've got to focus on understanding our world, our data world, our meaning of data. And, and hold on to our data assets and not be driven by applications to go and create their own different versions. And then we have to, then we've got problems fighting to keep it going. Mohammed, does that 
Uh, does that sort of answer your question, or you you were going a little bit wider than than the data centric architecture? Were you talking specifically about a dupe? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, so I mean, Hadoop brings in, uh, I mean, that's really nice in terms of centralizing different types of data and bringing data together, and it's certainly an approach to try to build a, a single reservoir of data and, and to keep the data so that you can look after it. But, I, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it has its role in some cases, but it's not solving the big problem of, what are the applications going to use in terms of using the data and keeping a single data model across the different areas so I know exactly where all my data is. Now, certainly data lakes and that are, are introducing data catalogs and metadata that allow us to find it, but it's not enforcing a harmonization and a standardization and, and that single data model. So they, they certainly have roles to play, and I, and I wouldn't suggest throwing them away, but I would uh, that the, that thinking about focusing on the semantics and bringing that that consolidation together, I think that's a that's an approach that takes data catalogs and that um, because that's not enough to introduce that common understanding, common way of 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 looking after our assets. It's just telling us what assets we have and what what's there it's not enforcing standardization and harmonization as paul bolton has pointed out great excellent so lovely lovely work i mean he he's got some good points and i mean you know, i'll even sort of admit to that he's he even made the recommendation that we should throw away the dm book and i get it i, I get what he's trying to say is 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 we, these different areas are, are, are causing us to have all the different splits within data and, and aspects like that. Um, and, and it is about focusing on the semantics, and that is important. I don't think you need to go to the point of throwing away the DM buck because it's, we will still need master data. We'll still need some of these areas involved to achieve what we need to do. The metadata, the data quality, you know, you, you don't just go to semantics and you can ignore data quality, what I do think his point is, is that everything should be expressed in terms of semantics. So what is the quality of common understanding, common meaning? I think that's what his message is. Any, any, any other questions? I know there's lots and there should be. <laughs> this is, I mean, it took me uh, several weeks to, to try to comprehend that and, and I must admit, that until I, I have a lot more understanding of, especially around, is it possible to get a single core ontology and then to extend it in a way that uh, doesn't break some of my data storage techniques and, and then cause me to store data all over the place? Uh, I'd, I'd love to see that happening. Um, he certainly has, he provides several cases, case studies of where he's done it, or where people have taken on that task. But I'm not seeing many big organizations jump up and down and say we've got to go data centric. Guys, thank you very much. Any any more questions, Paul? Are you are you sort of comfortable? I know I know you probably got a lot of questions, but yeah, sorry about that. I think it was a good conversation, and I think um, to really comprehend that, as you say, it takes quite a lot of time. To first comprehend it and then to decide, okay, yeah. what, where, what to do with this, right? Yeah, so and how, do, how, how, would, how would I bring it in? And, and I found when I saw it the first time, I thought, shucks, I, I could do that on top of a, a, a enterprise data warehouse. And mm. Connie's just made a comment there. His ontology, that core ontology is called gist, which is, you know, it's an English word for the gist of things. What, what is the core? The gist of of the element. So it's a nice it's a nice term. Yeah. I know Connie's also spent quite a bit of time listening to him and 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 reviewing that architecture. It, it's nice. It's nice to stretch your thinking and understanding of of what it is and where you could possibly bring some of that thinking in. But yeah. thanks, Connie. Thanks for the links.
Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate Thanks, it. Alex. Excellent. Great Thanks, conversation. Thank you. Cheers. Thank cheers. you so much. Have cheers. a nice night. Bye. Cheers, cheers.